So it's uh, four o'clock. If it's okay with you guys, we're going to get started. Um, but yeah. welcome everyone to another edition of Tumor Talk. This is the collaborative effort between the Journal of Neuro-Oncology and Lenox Hill Neurosurgery, where we talk about recent publications in the journal. We talk about really with the authors, the rationale, the results, and really the clinical relevance of their studies and how they relate to neurosurgery. So uh, we are pleased to have with us today an international um, cohort of uh, of physicians who contributed on um, uh, this recent study. Why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about the work that you've done and um, what you guys do. Good evening, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Christian Feischlag. I'm the Vice Chair of Neurosurgery at the Medical University in Innsbruck. And I'm together here with the co-authors, the first author of the study, Matthias Demetz, who is a resident in Innsbruck, and Alexander Krieger, who is a young attending in Innsbruck. And together we worked on this paper on incidental low-grade gliomas that was published in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology quite recently. Amazing. Um, do you guys want to, do you have a presentation you want to share? We can dive right in. Yes, I'd like to share my screen. Great. While you pull that up, it's always a pleasure to have um, contributors from overseas that we appreciate and we understand the time uh, difference. And so thanks so much. You're very welcome. So the title of the paper was same but, right ahead. same but Different Incidental and Symptomatic Lower Grade Gliomas Show Differences in Molecular Features and Survival. The background of the study is that we are seeing an increasing incidence of head MRI scans in the OECD countries over the past years. And this comes together with the highest number of CT and MRI scans in surprisingly the US and Austria. So we, we the both countries do the most CT and MRI exams uh, per 1,000 inhabitants. So we have an increasing number of incidental findings of different kind of um, neurosurgical diseases. So how do we treat our asymptomatic patients? Historically, it was a wait and see procedure, but you have a risk of early malignant transformation or earlier malignant transformation. So we see a paradigm shift towards earlier surgical treatment that has been published over the past years and advocates an earlier and more aggressive surgical intervention in low-grade gliomas. But there's few data on the molecular features and the survival of those earlier interventions. Tumor growth is known as an independent prognostic factor. So the velocity of the tumor uh, growth over time in the three-dimensional volumetric analysis is known to be a very, very sharp prognostic factor for the outcome of low-grade gliomas. And there's different use of MRI and PET over um, different countries. So we put together a European cohort of how specialized centers dealt with uh, um, MRIs, PETs, follow-up scans, what they do. And this has also been published in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology a couple of years ago. So what we did in this paper is we digged in our Neuro-Oncology database. We put out WHO grade two or three gliomas. It's worthwhile to mention that it's still the old classification on that. So you see the, the, the uh, Latin numbers. All adult patients having a first surgery between 2010, 2019. And we evaluated the tumor volume pre and post operatively and the key molecular markers for low grade gliomas IDH1, ATRX, and EGFR. So this is what we, what we did, and also the immunohistochemical and um, other means of um, molecular um, diagnostics. So the results, it was uh, 160 patients in total, 23 of which were incidental cases. Um, it's a slight um, more males with a median age of 47 years. And the reasons for the MRIs for the incidental cases was in 12 cases of migraine. Some cases had uh, MRI following a CT for a different specialty, for example, ENT or ophthalmology cases. Two patients had a trauma and uh, an incidental finding uh, was confirmed. One was uh, during staging after systemic cancer disease. And one happened to be the guinea pig for a new MRI sequence. He's, he worked in a radiology department and he just tried out the new sequence and they found a low-grade glioma on him. So the median age in the incidental group was, was significantly younger but with a 38 years um, median. Um, and the temporal location was higher in the uh, symptomatic low-grade gliomas, which was expectable because they usually uh, turn up with a seizure. 
Cerebellar location, which is also quite rare, was even the 30% in the incidental low-grade glioma cohort. The, uh, the majority of um, symptomatic low-grade gliomas also showed some kind of anaplastic transformation. So it was not a clear grade 3 tumor, but some kind of anaplastic islet within the tumor with a higher metotic activity and also a higher IDH wild-type um, group. The, the tumor volume was also expectably higher in the symptomatic cohort, for sure. Um, and also the extent of resection was better in the incidental group. So we can could achieve a larger resection in those patients with incidental findings of the lower grade gliomas. And this translated well into a um, beneficial survival analysis for PFS and also for overall survival with a highly significant difference between those two groups. So to quickly conclude that, I would like to say that the incidental low-grade glioma showed a more favorable molecular and neuropathological features that might cause a slower or less aggressive growth. On the other hand, you could say it might be a kind of pre-low-grade glioma stadium. This might explain also the lower tumor volumes and the incidental findings or the, symptom, the, the absent symptoms. On top of that, the incidental group benefits from an early surgical treatment, even with an asymptomatic stage after higher probability of total resection without causing permanent neurological deficits in those patients. And as I mentioned before, it translated into a, a highly significant enhanced progression-free and overall survival in those two cohorts. Thank you for listening. No, thanks so much for presenting. Um, you know, a really great study. And first off, we always like to thank our presenters for for obviously choosing the Journal of Neuro-Oncology um, to publish in. Uh, and I, I find it super fascinating. I guess, you know, the one of my questions for you guys after after reading it and hearing you guys is, um, you know, the, the fact that cerebellar tumors accounted for a slightly higher, you know, uh, percentage of the tumors that were incidentally discovered. Do you think that the molecular differences you're seeing are related to the tumor location, or do you think it's intrinsic to gliomas at this stage, whatever it be, that they're growing slower, they're less aggressive, um, do you, or is it more of a location-based? What do you think? I think it's not location-based. I think we are looking at a, a very a different cohort of tumors that are maybe very early in their, their lifespan. So probably all the features that might add up to a more malignant behavior or to more symptomatic behavior um, are probably developed over time. So I'm just, I, I think we're looking at a very early stage of low-grade glioma as a disease in those patients, um, which probably enables us to do a very um, beneficial job by doing a maximum surgery for those patients, because we can't even estimate the, the survival of a cohort that is mainly incidental and and um, surgically treated in a, on a maximum level. So um, I, I don't think it's it's related to the location. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my interpretation as well. We're, we're, it kind of gives a lot of insight into the development of this disease, right? And so you're in these incidental tumors, presumably you're catching them at this very early stage where there is a transformation from a normal cell into a glioma cell or, or from, you know, stem cell or oligoprogenitor, whatever you want to believe it is. Um, but it hasn't yet acquired, you know, all the negative aspects and negative mutational components that are going to make it um, a real negative, you know, in someone's life. And so you're able to get a better resection and extend survival. Um, do you think it's worth going back and reclassifying it according to the new data or the new classification system, I should say? I think that's really different, difficult because you have a, 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 a very small cohort and we, we are also facing problems. Everybody faces problems now with the new classification because a lot of data we used to, to interpret and we used to use in our daily practice is changing. So we, we're looking at studies where um, one group uh, has a certain percentage of something that is now glioblastoma. It's the same, same also in our paper. There are some tumors that might be classified much higher right now. So, so that's that's a basic problem, and I think it's it's the the molecular based um, classification of tumors is is one side. I think we should enter more additional features, like for for example the incidental um, diagnosis or for example the the tumor growth. So if you if you 
uh, take the time, take one or two M MRIs and follow up and then measure the, the, the expansion um, velocity, then you will find um, a very good estimate of how this tumor will behave probably. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, I guess it brings back a question that I know has been asked before and it never seems to come to fruition is, you know, should there be screening MRIs at some point? Um, you know, catch these things super early. But I think from a, from a cost benefit analysis, that's never held to be a, a, a valid uh, concern. What do you guys think? No, that that that's that's that might depend on the country. Basically, um, we had this discussion a couple of years ago in the European local like Greg Lyoma network, and uh, Emmanuel Mondoné from Paris did a calculation that's valid for France, mm -hmm. and he said it takes uh, uh, you do a lot of MRIs, but you can cut down the 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 sequences to basically a three D flare. Um, you do a lot of MRIs, but if you find like 10 of them, 10 of those incidental low grade gliomas, and you can treat five of those 10 perfectly in terms of a super maximal resection, then it might end up to a, to a cost effic uh, efficiency in those patients um, because those patients will be alive without progression very long time, only estimates yeah. for sure. And this might add up to, to being cost efficient. So um, I think it's, it's worth looking into that, but it's a, a huge public health um, issue. So yeah. you have to, to get public health experts in that and to calculate that. But I'm not sure if it's, um, there's so many, so many downsides to that. So you do the 3D flare and probably yeah. you find a four milli, three millimeter ACOM aneurysm. Do you tell that to the patient or do you, don't you tell that to the patient? So there's a lot of ethical questions also attached to that, which makes it more difficult than just doing the, the tumor screening. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I imagine also as technology advances, you know, there's portable MRIs now, there's all these things that that screening is going to become more cost effective. And then you get really into the weeds of the ethical component of this, right? Um, you know, you'll be able to go anywhere and get a, you know, like when you walk through a, an airport and put your hands up, it'll be a quick MRI and sequence kind of thing. Um, and it'll be cheap. And, and so then you get into the other part of that is, you know, what's the ethical right, right thing to do in those situations. Um, listen, I commend you guys. I think it's a fantastic uh, contribution in the journal. I think it's super interesting in terms of um, how these diseases develop. And I think the outcomes component is remarkable that if these diseases are caught at an early stage, and granted it's a small cohort, but it supports what we've published previously as a, as a community, right? That um, early intervention on these low grades really does extend progression-free survival and overall survival. And, uh, and I think the study gives us a lot of insight into kind of the history of this disease and, and what it does. So uh, I commend you all for, for the effort and um, look forward to seeing more from you guys in the future. Um, any final re remarks before we sign off for the day? Do you want to say something, guys? <laughs> no, I think it's 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 worth looking into that, and I think it's worth to to join efforts because it's it's still considered a rare disease. So that's that's the point. So we're still looking at a, a disease that is classifiable as a rare disease. So we should gather our 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 databases, should gather our, our tumor tissue databases, and try to get something underway for for really like underlying the, the thesis that um, it's it's worth doing a really early maximum safe resection of those tumors because that's something we can at least talk about 20, 25 years of survival. It's just an estimate, just a, just a gut feeling somehow yeah. um, it, for those patients. And that's, that's more everything else could ever achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, we'd be more than happy to, to help out with that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, we'll keep the conversation going. All right, well, listen, uh, it's a great contribution. I really appreciate your guys' time. We like to keep things short and sweet so people don't lose interest. And uh, we look forward to your next publication in the journal and your next visit to Tumor Talk. So have a great afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.